Welcome to the Utah Water Conservation Forum's Virtual Spring Conference. We have a great lineup for today's session. We'll kick things off with three short presentations focusing on growing sustainability for business and universities, and we'll follow this up with a Q&A session. After a short break, we'll switch gears and cover new water saving technology that's making an impact. excited to kick this off today. I think uh, this is a fun opportunity. It's uh, unfortunate that we have to be on Zoom, uh, but hopefully we'll be in person next year for our uh, annual spring conference. But I'd just like to welcome everybody and, and let everybody know that really the mission of the forum is to help provide uh, education and training and support uh, anybody out there who is looking for assistance with water conservation um, we're happy to, to to reach out and work with you uh, both with our uh, our day-to-day -day work as we're all involved with conservation and as a forum and and hopefully we can do um, uh, provide valuable uh, information to you today that you can take back and also link you up with uh, some very knowledgeable professionals uh, that can help you advance uh, with your own water conservation goals. And with that, I will turn it over to our first uh, panelist. Uh, go ahead, Shelby. Um, I'm Shelby Erickson and I'm a water conservation coordinator with the Utah Division of Water Resources. And I also am part of the Utah Water Conservation Forum. Um, I'm going to be moderating a panel on sustainability. Um, our first presenter is Alexi Lamb um, from Utah State University. Um, she is Utah State University's Sustainability Coordinator and Sustainability Council Chair. She works with faculty, staff, and students to integrate sustainability into campus operations and academic programs. Um, she enjoys working on the breadth of sustainability from planning greenhouse grass reduction to organizing events and trainings. Um, she has a BFA from Arkansas State University and an MPA from Indiana University. And as of May, 2021, she has completed her third and final um, three letter degree, a PhD from Utah State University. So we will turn the time over to Alexi. Hi, my name is Alexi Lamb and I'm the sustainability coordinator at Utah State State University and the Facilities Planning Design and Construction Office. Dave Miller, USU's plumbing foreman, and I will be discussing some of USU's indoor water conservation practices. The university has made progress over time, but we're still learning. I hope to share a part of the university's journey for others who are also working toward more efficient practices. So thank you for having us. Dave and I both work in USU facilities which primarily manages the Logan Academic Campus. USU Housing, for example, manages its own facilities and grounds. And although facilities does some work on USU statewide campuses, for the purposes of this presentation, we're discussing Logan. Facilities mission is to provide an environment for education, innovative learning, and its application in the worldwide community. And it's relevant to this conversation because that is the main focus of uh, facilities is to support those missions. But facilities supports the university's other goals as well. Within facilities, we house a lot of the university's sustainability efforts. The university has a sustainability policy, uh, which was adopted in 2007. And more recently, sustainability has become a part of the principles of practice identified by Aggies Think Care Act. USU and USU facilities have been concerned with responsible conservation of resources for a long time. Even before this timeline starts, uh, I'm starting here because these are some of USU's concerted efforts directly targeting sustainability. However, outdoor water use, you might not really see on this list, um, but it is one of the most visible things uh, that people notice about USU sustainability efforts. Indoor water use, conversely, receives a lot less attention. And a few reasons that might be true is because it's less expensive as a resource financially uh, than 
some of our other sustainability, like energy saving initiatives. It is less influential in climate change than greenhouse gas emissions. And outdoor water use is just so much greater in volume and is more visible than indoor water use. Thus, indoor water use may be something you've heard about a little bit less, at least from the university. Yet, it's in one of USU's most prominent commitments. The American College and University President's Carbon Commitment led the university to start certifying new buildings as LEED Silver or above in 2007. You'll see it on this timeline as ACUPCC. And then for reference, LEED, uh, L-E-E-D, stands for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. All new buildings uh, must meet LEED standards and they also must meet the, the state of Utah's high performance building standards. They specifically address uh, design for indoor water conservation and the LEED standards specifically ask for metering to provide information at at least the building level. And in some places, sub metering will provide it more specifically to certain types of water use. One of the requirements that is similar in both LEED and high performance building standards is they both use water sense labeled products, which meet EPA specifications performance, meaning they need to perform at least as well as everything else on the market. They also must use 20% less water than baseline fixtures. I'm providing some examples from one of USU's newer buildings, the Life Sciences Building. LEED designates the baseline, that's that middle column, and in the design process, USU specifies fixtures that reduce indoor water use by at least 20%, and those are the usages that are listed in that far right column. USU's new buildings go through this process and the calculations are submitted as a part of LEED certification. Now, you may notice uh, the types of things that are here on the left, toilets, urinals, uh, commercial dishwasher, ice and seat machine. We also would have possibly some other lab equipment or um, there are other water uses on campus, but because facilities mainly manages our academic buildings as opposed to housing, you'll see a lot less in terms of showers or uh, things that would be used for more domestic uses. A lot of that would be more in our housing area and then um, whatever it is that we're using in our academic buildings would be the kind of thing that we're doing this analysis for. By using efficient fixtures that meet Utah's high performance building standards and lead requirements, the Life Sciences building uses about 39% less water than a standard building. And that adds up to hundreds of thousands of gallons a year less that's being used by this one building. And you can only imagine what that means if you're looking at a university scale. So that's one of the main things that we do to work on reducing indoor water consumption, but we have to address it from a lot of different directions. And another thing new building requirement is metering, and that helps us uh, with leak detection. So all USU's new buildings have meters, and almost every existing building does too. This helps us with comparing similar buildings to each other, so we can see if a building is using a lot more than a similar building, we can look and try to compare. Also, it helps with comparing a building to itself over time to see if it's using more than the same building did in the past. Additionally, facilities maintenance staff and building occupants can report visible leaks to facilities customer service to have them fixed. And this helps with things like dripping faucets, uh, things that people using the building can see. But facilities also has to monitor leaks in the ground. Because of the rocky soil and fantastic drainage that we have on the bench, the university can't always see water bubbling up to the surface like some other soil types would do uh, in the case of a leak. And so the university actively has to monitor for ground leaks. And due to these conservation efforts, including leak detection, a replacement of old water lines and changes in the building, such as closing the trailer court that used to be located on the east side of campus, the replacement of older buildings over time, potable water consumption use, 
uh, and potable water is the drinkable water that is being used in the buildings, although it is used some of our landscape on campus. Much of our landscape water is also canal water. So looking only at our potable water use, that has decreased by 56% per campus user since 2009, and that's huge. And we've learned some things that are going well uh, among them, and I can't say this enough, leak detection. But we found that other measures have worked, like pint flush urinals work better than waterless, timed faucets also seem to work, yet we still have a lot of room for improvement. In this photo, you can see a student project comparing a newer, more efficient fixture to older ones in the Natural Resources Building. So this was a student research project funded by a student sustainability grant, and these are the kind of the variety of fixtures we have in our buildings because many of USU's buildings were built before LEED standards or high performance building standards were required. So they were uh, complying with different codes and regulations and they may be using older fixtures that are less efficient. Even among our newer buildings, some efficient fixtures are more difficult to maintain than others. And sometimes occupants do not like the feel of like low flow faucet, or they might not be familiar with toilets that have more than one flush option. So they might not know how to use it or find it confusing. And those are things that we need to work on. So we've identified areas for improvement. We are trying to improve how we identify and specify fixtures for new construction so that they conserve water, which is important, and they're also easy to maintain for our plumbers and easy to understand by people who are using the building, uh, easy to use, but not, not so much that people use them too much. <laughs> and learning more uh, as an organization, we can do more to communicate that to occupants. And hopefully these can be complementary efforts between the types of buildings that we're building and the fixtures we're putting in them and also better understanding and communication both among us as we work in facilities and among the people who are using the buildings. USU has done a lot to conserve water and water use, and we still have a lot of room to learn and to do more. And Dave is here for the Q&A session. So thank you so much for your time. All right, thank you to Alexia and David um, for that presentation. We are going to move on to the next one, um, which is by Alicia Gerald, who is with the Marriott Medical, Merit Medical Sustainability Program. Um, Alicia serves as the Merit Medical Systems Vice President of Environmental, Social, and Governance. Alicia has the privilege of telling Merit's um, story of sustainability while also partnering with internal and external stakeholders to continually seek out areas where Merit um, can make the biggest impact within the communities that we work and live. Um, Alicia holds a bachelor's and master's degree in accounting and is a licensed CPA. Um, she has called Utah home her entire life and resides in the small city of Payton, Utah with her husband and four children. We will turn that over to you. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you, appreciate that. Um, I'm happy to be here with you today uh, to talk about my favorite topic, which is sustainability. Um, I have been with Merit now for close to seven years. Um, and the last three, I've had the opportunity to work um, in the field of sustainability. Um, the, just a little bit about Merit Medical. Um, we have about 900, we did about 964 million in sales last year. It was a little down from the year before because of COVID. Um, so put a little kink, kink in the works, but uh, this uh, next year, we're hoping to, to reach the billion dollar sales um, threshold. We have just under 6,000 global employees. We manufacture approximately 2.2 million units uh, per day at our manufacturing facilities around the world. And we have approximately 2 million square feet of manufacturing, commercial, distribution, and research space. We, um, our largest manufacturing facilities uh, by, by just people employed goes uh, our Salt Lake City operations here in Utah is number one. Second is our Mexico operations located in Tijuana. Third would be our Galway facility in Ireland. Um, fourth would be our Pearland facility in Texas. 
And then uh, we've got a manufacturing facility in Singapore. We've got a manufacturing and distribution facility in Richmond, Virginia. And uh, we've also got a, a facility in Brazil Paris, and Paris. So um, distribution centers all over the world. So we're very much a, a large global company that manufact design manufactures and distributes uh, single use disposable medical devices. So something that I learned from the get go when I first took over trying to tell Merritt's story of, sustain of sustainability was that the the more I worked at it, the more I understood that as a public company, um, and I think I believe this goes for for anyone, whether you're a university, a publicly traded company, a private company, a small business. In a lot of ways, if you're not trying to tell your story of sustainability, somebody else is going to try to tell it for you. So this was very evident when I looked at some of the perceptions of our shareholders and customers um, that they had their own uh, views of Merit Medical. Analysts like to uh, try to tell our story for us. And a lot of times they were incorrect. So the most important thing that I, I just wanna kind of put out there today, if you remember nothing else <laughs> about my presentation, remember that it's important for you to tell your story of your company's or your organization's sustainability journey, because if you don't, somebody else will try to, try to do it for you. Um, a little bit about kind of how we are governed at Merit Medical when it comes to sustainability is that we have um, governance at the board level with an, an ESG, that's Environment, Social and Governance Committee of the Board of Directors. Um, we have our chairman and chief executive officer that sits on the next level. We have an executive sponsor who is our chief operating officer, Ron Frost. I chair the council as vice president of ESG. Um, and then we have a cross-functional um, team of council members that represent the interests of merit in all aspects of the company um, that work on our ESG committee as well. So when we think of things like conservation and water and projects that we want to take on, what we want to tackle, it's this committee that comes together to, to uh, discuss it, to do the studies, to make the, uh, look at our risks and opportunities, and to make a strategy for Merit's uh, projects, sustainability initiatives, and, and what we prioritize as we go down. We set, uh, they set the strategy and objectives and they align those with um, the needs and expectations of merit stakeholders. Um, the most, probably the most important, not the most important, I mean, there's a lot of aspects of sustainability um, that deal with social um, governance, but uh, it seems like a lot of the focus always gets put on the environmental part of sustainability. Um, and that's what we're here today to discuss is, is the environmental aspects of Merit Medical um, and what we do to um, manage those and to take care of the communities that, where we work and, and uh, manufacture and serve and live. Um, water is what we're, we're here to talk about. Um, and water is something that Merit uses a lot of as a manufacturer of plastic, mostly plastic medical devices that are meant to be used um, one time that takes a, a great deal of water. We also have um, other things that we manufacture. For example, Merit is the parent company of a company that manufactures sensors that go inside of our medical devices, but they also sell those sensors to um, other industries like the airline industry. Uh, they were used a lot in ventilators with the COVID pandemic. Um, the sensors are also used in dive watches um, and things like that. So we, we use them in our products and we sell them to other industries as well. Fabricating those sensors takes a very large amount of water. Um, and I would, I would guess um, that out of all of Merit's um, processes, sensors is probably the largest use of water. So when we, as a sustainability council, place importance on water, we we like to, the first, the first thing we needed to do was to, to start measuring and start looking at our risks. So 
and this this data is for 2020. In 2020, at all of Merit sites, over 10,000 square feet or more. So that would be manufacturing and distribution centers for the most part. Uh, we use 215,300 cubic meters of water, which is approximately you know, 56.8 million gallons of water. Um, we like to measure our intensity. Um, that, that number can seem very large, but what does that really mean? I mean, if, if Merit starts adding more products to their line, of course their water is going to go up. So saying that we just need to use less water doesn't quite tell the story. We need to understand what the intensity is per revenue that we earn. So what we do is we try to index that water usage to the amount of revenue that we're earning per year. So for example, in 2020, our index number was 0.223, meaning that we used 0.223 meters, cubic meters of water for every thousand dollars of revenue that we earned, um, which also relates. I, I measure it in the, in the metric system because that's what the rest of the world does, but sometimes it means a little bit more to us Americans to have it in gallons. So that's roughly half of a gallon of water per every thousand dollars of revenue, or for, excuse me, for every dollar of revenue that we earn. So what we have done is really looked at, we, we've used 2020 to, to measure, to really um, go in and site by site, start environment tracking environmentally. We'd done that in the past, but we hadn't got specific enough to understand what's being used at, at the site versus other sites, what's being used by the specific processes at that site, and what does that mean to us when we index that down to our revenue? Um, we've done this with water, we've done it with our energy usage, we've done it, we've also taken the time this year to really um, gather all of that data and convert it over to understanding how much greenhouse gas are we emitting in our, in our facilities, our production and distribution facilities that are over 10,000 square foot, uh, square feet in, um, in space. So what we have done is come up with some, some good uh, operational sustainability goals that we intend to achieve by the year 2030. So for example, 50% of our total energy used will come from renewable sources by the year 2030. Um, our energy intensity, so again, taking that energy me measurement and then indexing that to our revenue and getting an index number, we want to see that coming down. If it comes down, it means we're becoming more efficient. If it's going up, it means that we're, becoming, <laughs> we're not becoming efficient. So it can't just be, let's use less energy. You have to be able to index that to understand, even, in, even while you're growing, even if you're adding lines. I'll give you an example of this uh, in just a minute. Even when you're in a growth phase, you still need to be working to bring that per dollar of revenue intensity down um, so that you are becoming truly more sustainable and more efficient. Um, we've committed that our water intensity will decrease by 10% or more index to revenue. These kind of seem like small percentages, but for a large global manufacturing like Merit, um, it, it's actually quite a feat, <laughs> believe it or not, to get that, that reduction. And then, of course, we want our greenhouse gas emissions to decrease by 15% or more index to our revenue by the year 2030. Um, water is, is kind of what I'll focus on for the remainder of, of my presentation here because that's what we're here to really talk about is water. So one of the things that I really felt strongly that we needed to do is to really understand both our opportunities and our risks when it came to water around the globe. What you see here on this screen is our five largest, um, our five largest uh, manufacturing facilities and they're ranked by their water risk. So for, for this purposes, I've, I've um, ranked them for water depletion. So you can see the river basin that they're pulling out of and the country that they're in, the river basin that they're pulling out of. And the tool that I use looks at water depletion. It looks at their baseline water stress and it looks at their available water remaining. Um, and, and this look or this risk assessment is meant to give you a current picture of, of you know, this year, today, with some level 
of future risk. So it's not meant to say, oh, by 2030, this is what it's going to look like. This is meant to be a snapshot in time to say, this is where you're at. And this is where the trend is heading. Um, there are other tools out there if you're interested that where you can designate a year in time. Um, and you can see how how based on scenario analysis, uh, if you believe the mean average temperature of the earth is going to exceed 2% or two degrees Celsius, excuse me, uh, you, can, you can input that information into some of these online tools and it can show you what, what it would look like at 2030 given that sort of risk assessment. Um, but as you can see, our, our most at-risk site is in our Tijuana, Mexico. Um, uh, plant, which is not our biggest plant, um, but it's soon going to be. So when you think about business strategy, and, and I just got done presenting to our board of directors about this very thing. If you hire a consultant and you say, hey, we want to, we want to increase our share, um, share price, we want to increase our free cash flow, we want to do better financially, they would tell you, we'll start moving everything to Tijuana. Why? Because they have a much lower um, labor rate there. And so it makes sense to move a lot of your labor intensive products, uh, maybe not so much your automated, but more of your labor intensive products to Tijuana. Well, that I, there's a problem with that <laughs> because Tijuana represents, if, if you're moving lines that use a lot of water, it's not a good idea probably to move that to Tijuana. If you do move it, then you've got to have a plan in place to, to become a, a lot more energy efficient. Um, and have uh, risk mitigations in place for the fact that that is your highest risk area for water. Salt Lake City is close behind them um, with the second level. And then uh, Texas was surprising to me um, in that uh, I think of Texas as like hurricane city. We have hurricanes there every year. I'm thinking they get plenty of water, but not, not so. The Texas has actually come in a third. And then of course, Galway being our, our least risky site, um, there they get rain all year, all year long. It seems every time I visit there, <laughs> it's raining. So this is this assessment has allowed us to, as a um, corporate sustainability council, to think more about our strategic plan when it comes to growing our company. Um, we have to be aware of this, and we have to start mitigating this. Um, to be, be a sustainable company and to be responsible to the communities where we live and work. Um, to do this, the strategy to, to get that 10% reduction, it's merely an exercise in being able to look at what you're doing today, you, uh, looking at the usage before um, your reduction, looking at your trends and building it out to 2030. Um, you can see that we've, we've um, of course, we're gonna look at the cost we're gonna track our usage before any reduction and the spend. Uh, we have a reduction target in place. Here's our usage after, and then of course, spend after the reduction. And so we wanna start seeing that index number come down. What you don't see on here is, is what the forecast is for the indexed number moving down. Now, I anticipate that as we start implementing um, initiatives, it's gonna be kind of like, uh, the law of diminishing returns, right? So at first, when we start looking at our systems, and I'll give you a great example. For I, I mentioned that our sensor systems were, were something that used the most water. We're looking at implementing a, a process now where cur currently what happens is that a lot of that water gets taken to a scrubber and the scrubber, um, you know, uh, brings that, uh, all the contaminant, the acid that they use in that water, it brings it into a scrubber and it falls down into a water uh, neutralization system and it has sensors that read that pH and it adjusts that water back by either adding base or acid to it to get it to the right pH, but then we're dumping it down the drain. What we're, one of the solutions that we will be implementing um, later this year is putting in a system to, to recycle that water back through the process. Um, because it's, it's basically the acid in the water that's causing the problem. The water is not dirty. It just had acid in it to going through the fabrication process. So once that, is, that pH is brought back to, to the right level, why not just reuse it? 
again. So those are little things that in the past, it hasn't been a huge priority for us. Now in 2021 and moving forward, this is a huge priority. So we have to look at our processes and decide what can we do to reuse the water, recycle it in Tijuana. They're looking at ways that they can um, take the, the gray water use and, and recycle that back into their black water system for the toilets. So little changes like this will bring us great results. Um, I'm passionate, I, I'm probably running out of time. I'm gonna quickly wrap up, but one of the things I'm really passionate about is ISO 14001. It's a great uh, certification. It's all about your environmental management system. I've been spending the last two years getting all of our manufacturing sites to certify the ISO 14001. It provides the framework that the organization can build their foundation on. It, it's one thing to say, hey, we're gonna get better. We're gonna manage our environmental aspects, but it's another thing to actually certify to some Thing and, and year over year show that continuous improvement and hold that certification. So this has been huge, hugely important to change the behavior of Merit Medical from the process down to the frontline worker level um, so that we can realize those, those big results moving forward. Also, leadership is the key. Um, I, I harp on this all the time. You need to be asking good questions about things before you do that. Do you consider the environment in, in the design of your product? Something that I've had to do is, is really stress to the R&D team. You need to be considering this from the get-go. What can you do to reduce the plastic in our products? What can you do to make the packaging more um, recyclable? Can you reduce the packaging? Things like that. What can you do for your local environment, biodiversity? Are you asking your suppliers about their environmental data? Um, if, if you have your um, sustainability initiatives, you should be communicating that over to your suppliers and asking them to become more sustainable, or you move on to a supplier that helps you to be more sustainable. Um, and then the probably the foremost and first one is that top one, executive management. Are they using this type of environmental data in their decision-making and their strategy and risk assessment? Um, that's all that I have. I, I apologize if I went a little bit over. Um, I will stop sharing and thank you for allowing me to participate. Thank you, Alicia. All right, next up, um, we have Bailey Petty with Jordan Valley Water Conservancy District um, talking about Jordan Valley Strategic Water Management Program. Um, Bailey Petty is a conservation coordinator for Jordan Valley Water Conservancy District, where she is responsible for managing the district's strategic water management program. Um, strategic water management assists local businesses in identifying ways to eliminate water waste through improved processes or equipment updating. Bailey also supports Jordan Valley's residential programs and education, such as Flip Your Strip, Local Scape Rewards, and local landscape consultations. Bailey graduated with a BS in plant science from Utah State University. Thank you, Bailey. Thanks, Shelby. Uh, can you see my screen? All right. Yes, that looks great. Okay, great. So like Shelby said, my name is Bailey Petty. I am a conservation coordinator for Jordan Valley Water Conservancy District, where I am responsible for managing the district's strategic water management program. Uh, I also help support many of our other conservation programs and I will briefly go over those um, as well as where strategic water management fits in with our programs as a whole. So to reach the district's water conservation goals, we run programs and water conservation programs around the country are typically based on three primary building blocks, um, education, incentives, and regulations. And Jordan Valley Water now has programs in each category. So here are some of our water conservation programs. We started with education programs and that was our focus for 20 years or so. And um, the Conservation Garden Park was built um, to start that off in 2000 and has been a showcase for um, water efficient landscaping. And we created Local Scapes, which is a design concept for Utah's climate and water conservation needs. 
Um, and then a few years ago, we started our incentive programs, starting with residential programs for homeowners, uh, the Flip Your Strip program, local scape rewards, and others fall into that category. Um, and our newest incentive programs have been focused um, on the commercial, industrial, and institutional or CII water users in our service area. Uh, those are the Landscape Leadership Grant and Strategic Water Management, which is the program that I run and I'll be focusing on today. And then regulation is the last category and includes city landscape codes or ordinances, plumbing standards, um, and the district is also promoting landscape water efficiency standards for cities to adopt as part of that. So let's talk more about strategic water management. Uh, programs like this are being done extensively in other states as education and incentives for the commercial, uh, industrial, and institutional water users. Um, but up until now, not many conservation programs have been available for this group in Utah. Um, so this program is kind of new and there's still a lot to learn. Um, it is patterned after Rocky Mountain Power's energy incentive program, if you're familiar with that. Um, strategic Water Management is a program that offers custom incentives to help fund water management projects that eliminate water waste. So this program is pretty broad. It could include improving water intensive processes, upgrading equipment and fixtures, or installing altogether new water saving equipment. Um, as part of the strategic water management program, we offer CII water use assessments or audits. And assessments give us the opportunity to get on site and look at water use. Uh, we look for leaks, we look for outdated or inefficient equipment. Um, we look for water cooled or single pass water use, which is inefficient. Um, and I want to emphasize our goal is to reduce waste and not to restrict water use. Uh, the EPA says 20% of inside water is wasted, and that is something that we could find and that we can take better control of. Um, when I'm conducting these audits, I, I, there are three aspects of water use that I look into. Um, the mechanical aspect is how is the water being used? Operational, how is the facility programming or managing equipment? Are they using chemicals? Um, are they using submeters? Alexi just mentioned in her presentation how important submeters are for leak detection. So I definitely recommend and look for those. And then that last aspect is behavioral or routine water management. So are the staff looking for and noticing a continuously running drain, which could alert them of a broken valve or a leak? Water use assessments, uh, they help us identify water waste, but often the facilities manager already has a project in mind or they are aware of inefficient equipment. So like I mentioned before, this program is pretty broad and um, we designed it to be customized to the participants needs. But here you can see a short list of more common projects. Um, However, we will evaluate any ideas that save water for this program. So I'm gonna go over a few of the um, projects that we, or areas that we look at um, a little bit closer on audits. So cooling towers make a really good target when it comes to CII water auditing because they have the potential to waste a lot of water. Um, they can be a little bit tricky. They can all be very different. They have the same functions, but the configuration can be different. This cooling tower here is at Riverton Hospital. Um, and the sump or where the cold water is held is 
um, in the basement, they have a sump, which it was different than what we had seen. So it's, it's always a little tricky to find all of the pieces. It's kind of like a little scavenger hunt, um, but they definitely are a great target for us um, for water savings. Uh, when auditing cooling towers, I always look at the mechanical aspect. So the water coming in and the water going out and then the operational aspect or is how is the facility programming the sensor or the controller which controls the blowdown or the water going to the drain. And also are they adding uh, chemicals to reduce that amount of water that is going to the drain. And then the behavioral side would be, um, are the staff looking for and noticing the overflow? If the um, water coming in or the makeup, if that valve were to fail, uh, it would fail open to protect this equipment. So it would just be continuously flowing to the drain. And it might go unnoticed if that's not something that the facility has trained their staff to look for. And then kitchens have a lot of water using equipment. So they're another good target for us on our water audits. Um, the photo in the top corner here is a pre-rent spray valve. Uh, pre-rent spray valve retrofit can save a lot of water. So they're a great recommendation if a facility doesn't already have them. And there are a lot of water sense rated fixtures for restrooms and those give us a good base to compare equipment on site. Uh, so here I've just listed some of those ratings. A large part of water conservation is that behavioral or routine water management um, that I've briefly mentioned. So creating the habit to glance at a floor drain as you're walking past and notice if water is flowing into it. Um, and if it's continuously flowing over the entire day, it's something to investigate further. Uh, toilets, for instance, um, a small one gallon per minute leak adds up to uh, 1400 gallons per day. And toilets are just a minor offender when it comes to um, hundreds of other failure points inside a property. Oh, I skipped through, whoops. Go back. <laughs> All right, so training staff to look for waste as they walk and work uh, could eliminate a lot of water waste. And it's always something that we try to hammer really hard when we're on our audits. Uh, and then when businesses are interested in following our recommendations, we provide a financial incentive to update or replace equipment. Um, and incentives are based on water savings and the life of the equipment installed. So it looks like I'm at my time. Um, here's my email if you have specific questions, but I look forward to participating in the upcoming panel. Right, we're going to move to um, the Q&A portion of this. Um, and for our Q&A, we'll have Bailey, Alicia, and we also have Dave Miller joining us from Utah State University. Um, Dave Miller has been with facilities for 26 years. He started in the plumbing shop and worked there for two years um, and then moved to heavy equipment operators where he took care of all the outside utilities. Um, he spent almost eight years there. Um, then he started in the water quality shop where he was in charge of staying in compliance with state and local rules um, regulating the drinking water, storm, and wastewater on campus. Um, he maintained the two swimming pools in the HPER building and tested all backflow preventers throughout the campus. Um, he spent two years in water quality and has since moved to a position of foreman in the plumbing shop um, since 2007. So we will go to these questions. All right. Um, for the first presentation, so this one is probably for Dave um, on Dave and Alexi's presentation. What methods of communication have you used or plan to use at the university to help occupants understand how to use water wise faucets, toilets, etc.? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, as far as the people in the plumbing shop, we don't do any 
um, training or put any signs up or any literature out as far as um, uh, showing how to use um, different faucets or plumbing fixtures like that. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> All right, um, just a general question for everyone. Um, what are some barriers or challenges that your program or organization has faced with sustainability efforts? In the in the plumbing shop, we've had a few problems with the uh, with the lead buildings. Um, our um, Aggie Rec Center is a good example. Yeah, um, they put low flow aerators in that building. Um, it's been there for about two years. About a year after it was built, um, people were complaining about not enough water coming out of the faucet. So. Um, our plumbing shop had to go through and change all of those aerators to um, be able to get the proper flow out of those. And I had to do that on my budget. Um, and people don't um, understand that if you don't have enough water, um, you know, that's, that's just a problem. You don't, you don't have enough flow going through those aerators to, to wash your hands or, or something like that. Okay, thank you. Um, what about you, Alicia? So uh, one of the biggest challenges I've had with um, our facilities teams is they like to use water as a solution um, to another problem. So for example, uh, they'll complain that the low flow toilets constantly get clogged up and they're always, you know, uh, whereas if you have more water, it tends to flush the, the stuff down better. So they don't like the, the um, lower use water use toilets for that reason. They also, uh, we have clean rooms at Merit. So anytime an employee goes on break, when they come back, they have to gown back up and they have to wash their hands. So there's a lot of hand washing going on at Merit uh, and a lot of soap usage and facilities will say, well, unless we run those faucets for a good 30 minutes, at the end of the day to wash all that, you know, periodically to wash all that soap down the drain, it gets clogged up, the, the drains get clogged up. So <laughs> I'm like, yeah, that, that's not going to fly. You get down there and you use a tool to clean out that, that drain. You're just going to have to add it to your preventative maintenance routine. You can't use water as the solution anymore to fix the, the problem. So it's an easy solution, but it's also very wasteful. So that's one challenge that we've had with facilities teams is just getting them to go to a different tool other than, you know, water usage to fix the problem. Okay, thank you. Um, what about you, Bailey? Yeah, we've definitely heard similar things about low water using fixtures. Um, but one of the biggest challenges for our program has been um, communicating with facilities managers. A lot of times the um, interest is coming from upper management. And then when we start talking to facilities managers, they're not as interested. Um, and one thing we've done is we've had discussions with a lot of them and, and they've let us know that calling um, our assessments audits audit has a negative connotation. So we've started calling them water use assessments instead of water audits. Um, and just trying to that communication where we're explaining that we're just looking to reduce waste and we're not looking to restrict their water use or put in fixtures like, um, like you guys are saying, David mentioned that just aren't as powerful or don't work as well. So we're not trying to do that just um, trying to reduce that waste. So it's a lot of communication and um, just being upfront. Okay, thank you. All right, next question. Um, what advice would you give to others who want to be more sustainable and efficient? So I, I could take that one, um, if that's okay, Shelby. Um, my first advice is to, again, start, start with the measurement start looking at, at things that, that you can do. It, it also, and, and of course this is coming from a, a, you know, a, a commercial or a company point of view. It's the, the people on the front lines. It's the people that are doing the job every day. It's the students. 
It's the, you know, if you're at a university, um, it's your employees at a business. Start with them and get the participation and consultation of those people. They do the processes every day. They can, they know probably much better than you do where there's opportunities for conservation uh, because they're the ones doing the, the procedure. So it's when you, someone like me comes in and says, hey, let's assess and see what we can do to become more sustainable. If, if you're working from up here and you're not going down and getting participation and consultation from the people that are, are using the facilities every day, cleaning them, um, you know, working on the product, they're the ones that most often have the best ideas for reducing, reusing, and cons conserving. So I would definitely encourage you to get out from the upper you know, management area and get down and start talking to your people. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with that, Alicia. That's definitely something we found. Okay, great. Um, this next question is for Bailey. Um, what types of businesses have been interested in your program so far? Um, and what types of businesses have you been doing audits on? Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, so far, we've been doing, we've done some audits, um, a lot of training audits. This program's pretty new. Uh, we've been to Riverton Hospital, um, some office buildings, uh, a carbon fiber manufacturer, Hexel. So we've done some like bigger, larger scale audits, and but we're really hoping for the future to um, target some schools or grocery stores and just um, do some audits that are a little smaller and, and a little more straightforward. Cause some of those big ones, they do take a lot of special expertise in certain processes and they could take a little bit more time. Okay, great. And just a follow up question with that. Um, do you see it beneficial to work with school districts and parks departments? Yes, definitely. Um, the more connections we can make and just work with other entities, the better. So we're trying to reach out to our member agencies right now and work with them as well so that um, we can just get everyone involved and make sure people are aware of this program. Okay, great. We have a couple more questions. Um, what training do you need to perform the audits? Okay, so we, we actually hired a consultant to train us on these audits, um, Madaus Water Management, and they did a virtual training. And then we did three days of um, CII audit training, which was very helpful. Um, if you're interested in, in doing audits, there's, there's probably other um, information you can find. You might not have to hire a consultant, but I, it was very beneficial um, just getting knowledge in water using fixtures, cooling towers are a big one, uh, and just understanding water use. I think you could um, do an audit just fine. Okay, awesome. All right, and then um, one more question. Any suggestions on what is the best way to address water conservation in a smaller city entity? addressing leak, leaks at residential properties. Does anyone have any answers for that? Yeah, that's a good question. We've been actually thinking about some uh, residential leak detection programs. Um, we have land, our landscape consultation program where we, we sometimes uh, work with homeowners that have leaks. Um, and we'll we run through stuff like that. Um, just have them turn off everything in the home that's using water, and then we'll look at their meter if their meter's running. Um, then we can help identify a leak. Um, so doing something like if you're if you're a small town and looking for a program, a consultation, just having a consultation program would be great. Um, that would be my recommendation. Okay, great. All right, well, we are about at time. Um, I just want to thank Alexi, Dave, Alicia, and Bailey um, for their participation today. Um, you guys added a lot and we love hearing about your programs and your organizations and the great efforts that you're making. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, we appreciate everybody joining us today. We're glad you're here. Hopefully you enjoyed the, the first session and if some are just joining for this session, well, welcome. We're glad you're here. So this, <clears throat> this panel and this, this hour, we're gonna focus on how, water, uh, how new, tech, new water saving technology is making an impact yeah, you know, across the board. So we have, we've got three speakers and I will introduce each of them individually right before the presentation. We're first gonna hear from Stephanie Tanner with the EPA. She'll be followed by Joe Jackson with uh, Sprinkler Supply and followed by Stuart Irene. And I'll give a little more introduction each. Let's start with Stephanie. I'm gonna introduce Stephanie and then I'm, Stephanie, I'll turn it over to you. Um, and each of you will have about 15 minutes. I'll be compiling the questions and then following we'll, we'll address all of the questions at the end. And we'll, we'll go from there. So quickly, I'll introduce Stephanie. Stephanie Tanner is the lead engineer for the US Environmental Protection Agency's Water Sense program. She is responsible for all the technical aspects of the development of the labeled products, including setting efficiency and performance criteria, as well as managing the certification process. Prior to the EPA, she managed a water efficiency program for the federal facilities and wrote several guides uh, to water efficiency for the federal facilities. And she holds a, a bachelor's of science degree in marine engineering uh, from the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy and a Master's of Engineering Management from George Washington University. So with that, Stephanie, we'll go ahead and turn it over to you. So I'm Stephanie Tanner. I'm with the EPA's Water Sense Program. And uh, the Water Sense Program has been in, in place for about 16 years now. And um, we've, we are a, a water efficiency labeling program. So we label uh, products like uh, toilets, shower heads, irrigation controllers. Uh, we label programs like uh, for professionals uh, that are that certify water efficient professionals. Uh, right now, it's only in irrigation in the irrigation space, and then we also label homes and um, you know uh, like new homes and units in multifamily buildings. Um, so all of our products are certified by, are independently certified for both performance and water efficiency. And um, so when you see the label on products, and that's an example of the label, you can uh, be assured that the product will perform well and save water. So um, one of the first, you know, I'm focusing mostly on irrigation products because those are the ones we've been kind of focused on uh, recently. And um, since in 2011, we labeled weather-based irrigation controllers, and that was our first irrigation product. Um, it was interesting because there was, you know, sort of an industry standard for the product at the time, but the products weren't very user-friendly. There was a lot of issues. You know, people would uh, talk to us about how complicated they were, how hard it was to tell whether they performed well. So we spent a lot of time. Um, basically from 2006 to 2011, working on this product category. And at the time, there were about, when we issued the specification, there were about 12 models that met our criteria. And because the specification is now in place, there's over 800 labeled models from 25 different manufacturing brands. Um, a lot of these manufacturing brands have come into the market since we issued our specification. And one of the things I'll mention later on is that one of the things we're seeing specifically in, in the irrigation market is a lot of tech companies coming in. Uh, they're coming in with uh, iPhone or cellular phone app applications for these products. They're making them much more user-friendly. They're making them more accessible to a wider variety of people. Um, one of the things we've noticed over time uh, when we issued the specification the first time was that um, most of the controllers had a sensor. Sorry, of course my telephone is ringing right as I get into this call. Um, as you know, there was a, a preference for uh, devices that use a sensor in the field. And um, now there's a real preference for things that get a signal from some external source like the weather channel or from um, a local weather network uh, for agriculture. And they use that to, to to sort of determine what the weather is going to be at the site. And they may have a sensor on site that um, just sort of, you know, like a rain sensor or something like that, that uh, just basically shuts the system off if there's something really different from what the weather, the weather signal is telling them. So as I said, we have now 800 labeled models and we have 35 water providers that 
rebate to these products. So it's been really successful. So the specification includes, basically you have to use current weather as the basis for irrigation. In the past, a lot of these products used uh, historical weather and because of climate change that was has proven to be unreliable. So we require that they actually get the current weather. They have to modify, they can modify an uh, irrigation schedule based on ET. Uh, like I said, it includes both signal and sensor-based technologies, but signal-based technologies are becoming much more popular. And um, it includes both standalone controllers where the, the weather capability is integral to the controller and things that you can, that we call an add-on or a plug-in where you can update your existing clock timer um, with, the, with the weather capability to make it smarter. And in the last few years, we've even seen hose bib controllers that come in and they can collect the weather signal and control your hose bib, uh, you know, like for small irrigation systems or, you know, in places where you don't have a lot of in-ground systems. Um, and it just, it doesn't include rainfall devices or things that are used exclusively for irrigation. Next. Uh, the specification we just released last fall was for uh, soil moisture-based irrigation controllers. Um, we call them uh, SMS. Um, and they basically make a decision to allow watering based on actual measurements in the soil. Um, and uh, the, the user can sort of set what that threshold is, but a lot of them come automatically programmed to a certain threshold. And then over time, you can adjust that. Um, they work very differently from weather-based controllers because the weather-based controllers basically calculate the amount of rainfall that has fallen and then determine the irrigation schedule and then they create an irrigation schedule uh, based on the weather that's that they have seen in the past. Uh, weather uh, soil moisture based controllers are basically a bypass device. They uh, allow or inhibit irrigation based on the moisture levels in the soil. So it's possible that you can have uh, a weather based controller and then you can use the soil moisture sensor to send it data that says like, hey, the soil is really moist, um, you can shut off the system. So you can use both at the same time, or you could just use one or the other. Um, there's no real, I wouldn't say there's any real specific guidance on which one is better than the other. I think it just depends on your landscape, how it's laid out, where the zones are for moisture um, and the plant water needs and how you wanna like set up your system. and um, you know, so I think there's there's room for both in the market, and that's why we consider them to be equal technologies. So for our specification, as I said, they enable or disable irrigation events based on a soil moisture reading, um, and they have now wired and wireless technologies. So you can, if you have a wired system, then you put the soil moisture sensor in the soil, and then you trench a uh, like a, make a small trench back to your irrigation controller with the wire that uh, connects to a device that translates the soil from the signal from the soil moisture sensor to the controller. Um, but now there's there's starting to be more wireless devices where you can just bury your sensor in the soil and it communicates wirelessly with the controller. Um, it doesn't include just the sensor mechanism that sits in the soil and it doesn't include anything that's exclusively used for irrigation. But in both the weather-based and the soil moisture-based, there's, you know, that's it's it's a fairly clear line between agricultural and uh, sort of landscape systems in the residential market. But when you get to really large-scale commercial equipment, centralized station controllers, and things like that, there tends to be a little bit more crossover from irrigation products. Um, so we do label both, uh, you know, stuff that's appropriate for small residential systems, as well as the large central compute, uh, central station um, controllers. Next slide, please. Um, a few years ago, we labeled sprinkler bodies. We were trying to get to a label for the whole sprinkler, including the nozzle, but the test method for the nozzle wasn't really well defined yet. So we um, developed a test method with ASABE, which is a standard setting body for agricultural equipment uh, for pressure regulating sprinkler bodies. So these are uh, basically what connects the, the nozzle to the irrigation system. 
and they basically have to have integral pressure regulation. Um, and you know, to date, we have 350 models labeled. Um, we have a number of water providers that rebate these products. I was just going back. We don't have any model labeled models of soil moisture sensors yet uh, because the specification is still too recent. Um, manufacturers are still get are just starting to get their products tested. So we're hoping to see products with the label on it uh, appearing in um, probably late spring, early summer, or late summer. Next slide, please. So like I said, this includes uh, sprinkler bodies that have integral pressure regulation. It doesn't include anything that basically directs the water once it emerges from the, the body. So, and it's not, um, it doesn't include like micro irrigation devices or aftermarket devices that you would attach later on to the, to the system um, or hose end watering products um, at all. So next slide. Um, this is just, we revised our water sense uh, home specification and um, it just allows like a wider variety of people to, of organizations to participate in the program. Um, and it, instead of having a lot of prescriptive requirements for what the home has to have, uh, it basically does a lot, it does more modeling of the home water use and the home design uh, to sort of determine whether it uses 30% less water uh, than a standard home. Um, and we have now a number of certification organizations that, have, that can certify homes and we're starting to get homes labeled uh, to this new specification. Next slide, please. So one of the things uh, you know, we wanted to talk about was um, this issue with nozzles. Um, there's a lot of new nozzle patterns and new nozzle designs that are coming out that can lower the flow rate over standard nozzles. They have uh, you know, larger droplet size, that reduces water loss to wind and evaporation. Um, it's just been a little bit difficult to try and figure out what the metric is to measure their efficiency because so much depends on precipitation rates and, and things like that. So um, we're working on that standard, we're working on that specification now and I'm hoping that maybe sometime in the next year or two, we'll have agreement on what the test method will be and we can start labeling these technologies. Um, the next thing that seems to be really coming up is uh, flow meters and flow sensing. Um, this is both in like home dashboards where you have, uh, you can monitor your home's water use. And, um, and it also comes as sometimes an integrated uh, feature in especially some of the new um, sort of technology company based uh, irrigation controllers where they measure or make a calculation of how much water your, your irrigation system is actually using. Um, we're looking carefully at this to see if, because WaterSense has been interested in this whole uh, dashboard for home water use, to sort of give people more instantaneous feedback about how much water they're using. Um, I'm not sure how it works in Utah, but in, in Virginia where I live, I get a water bill every three months. And so I'm just really shocked three months later how much water <laughs> I used three months ago, right? So, um, but, you know, because I'm a water person, I'm sort of looking at things, but I don't really have a good sense of that unless I, you know, there's no way, there's no good way for me to tell on a daily basis how much water I use over from one day to the next. Um, but now they're having these, uh, you know, more meters and sensors that homeowners can put on their meter or they can um, insert, they can install inside their water line or strap onto their water line, and that can tell them a lot. And some of these work with irrigation controllers or could work with irrigation controllers over time, and that would help people understand how much water they're using for irrigation and in their household at the same time. Um, and some of them also can tell you um, whether something's leaking or not. They can tell you, uh, and some of them can shut off your water if there's a leak. Um, I was on a call the other day that said that a lot of people in Texas, when they had all that bad weather and the water line started breaking, people had these systems, uh, some of these systems installed on their homes, were basically able to go outside and shut off their water because the system told them exactly when the water pipe broke 
And they ended up like reducing the damage to their home significantly and not having to sit there and fear that at some point in time, something would break and they wouldn't notice it until the ceiling collapsed. So um, these things are starting to get better, uh, smarter, and, um, and we're interested in trying to label those in a, few, in, a few weeks, in a few months. Next slide. Um, and like I was saying before that most, uh, you know, controllers are now shifting to this uh, from this traditional clock based controller to more of these technology products. We have a lot of technology companies coming into the market space and that's shifting the way this system is, is these systems work. Um, like, and I, and I also said many controllers have these flow meters installed and they talk with, they can actually talk with some of these systems and make you know, give you a complete dashboard about what kind of water use you're using in the home. Well, thank you, Stephanie. <clears throat> we appreciate you sharing those uh, those thoughts. And it, uh, any questions that you may have for Stephanie, if you'll just hang on to those or type them in the Q and A box, I'll be compiling those. And at the end of the at the end of the whole panel, we'll get into some questions for each of these. So I appreciate that, Stephanie. Um, we're going to move on with Joe Jackson from Sprinkler Supply, and I'm going to let Joe do most of the introduction to himself, but he's with Sprinkler Supply. He's been there for 18 years. He's got a lot of background with irrigation, and so um, Joe, why don't I just let you do a little more introduction to yourself from there and then take it away. Um, try to keep it to about 15 minutes. Will do, David. Thank you. Uh, so Joe Jackson, Sprinkler Supply Company. Um, I manage our water management division, which means I get to work with all the fun stuff in irrigation, technology-based controllers, as well as pump stations and other technologies that help with conservation efforts. Um, we work from north to south, state and across the whole state. And our goal is to, to help customers identify what will help them achieve their goals um, through conservation and through a application of technology. So I get to work with a lot of manufacturers on their smart controllers, <coughs> excuse me, as well as uh, do training for end users and support contractors during the installation process. We also get to work with uh, landscape architects and designers. So we uh, are involved full circle in uh, utilization of smart controllers as well as implementation of those technologies. Um, today, I'm just going to, I've got a quick uh, presentation to go through. Um, I'll need to have Candace, if you can enable me to share my screen, that'd be great. And I'll get started on this. All right, okay. perfect. Okay. Thank you very much. All right, can you see my screen okay? Yeah, that looks great. Okay, thank you. All right, so as I mentioned, I work with Sprinkler Supply Company. Uh, some of the things I wanna talk about today real quick is just what's happening in the state of Utah. We know there's a lot of population growth. Uh, can add to that uh, water scarcity uh, with our with our just dismal year of water and snow up in the mountains. Uh, we're talking about water restrictions, associated water costs that we're seeing across the board that are in discussion and have been implemented. I just wanna to touch on secondary water some of the political aspects, no one likes to talk politics, but they're always there. And then what are the, some of the options that we have as uh, we are working with water? Um, Sprinkler Supply Company, like I said, we're statewide. We've got 12 locations uh, from Logan to St. George. And I'm based out of our West Jordan location, which is our, our main location. Um, I've been in irrigation for about 32 years. I've done irrigation design, uh, installation support, working with people as they, uh, adopt new technologies and implement those. And I think one of the biggest and most important things is uh, it's, I'm very excited about where technology's at and where it's going, but I really feel like the training and support is a key element to success with these technologies. Um, I have a lot of people I know will, will get a smart controller, they'll put it in, they'll be excited because they can turn it on from their phone. And there's just so much more to it than that. Um, if we truly want to, to see more conservation and better conservation. Um, if you haven't visited Utah lately, or if you haven't uh, left your home because of uh, COVID, 
then you haven't noticed that we have a lot of growth. Everywhere we go, we're seeing new subdivisions put in. We're seeing new houses being built. A lot of commercial is taking place to support the residential growth. And that just means that it's, we're going to have a higher demand on our water supplies. Um, one thing that I ask as I'm working with our customers is, what does this mean for your water footprint? How are you going to manage the water and make sure that it's available for the needs that you've identified? And then what tools are you going to use? What water management tools are you going to use to accomplish that? Uh, to go hand in hand with that is the water scarcity. Uh, this is one of the driest years that we've ever had. Um, as you can see by the uh, drought map on the right hand side there, um, this was just released today and there's not a single part of Utah that is not affected by drought and most of it is in exceptional or extreme drought. Um, this is really challenging when you couple that with the fact that uh, our reservoirs are at 69% storage capacity. Um, water restrictions are already being implemented. And if this is like the last few years, we could potentially see water being shut off early due to shortages. Um, working with a customer yesterday where they're already putting a plan in place in case this is what takes place if they are told they can't water throughout the whole irrigation system. As we talk about water restrictions, it's really interesting. Um, when you think restriction, you think something negative. And I like to I like to approach it as water conservation or water strategies um, as I as I talk with people. Uh, and the intention of these restrictions, you know, we heard the governor say a couple of days ago that uh, on all state facilities, no watering after 10 a.m. or between 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. and is encouraging all across the state to do that. And the intent is to limit when water can be used. Uh, we see time of day restrictions, like I just mentioned. Uh, some cities are already implementing a day of the week restriction. Some cities are actually putting out an allocation. Uh, this is how much water you have to use. And the biggest challenge is you have to invest time to make sure you understand how to implement this on your properties. But more importantly, how implementing that is going to help you conserve, help you save. Uh, there's a lot of people that will actually look at the water restrictions and say, oh, if I'm going to be restricted on the days I could use it, then the days I'm allowed, I'm going to use all I can. And, and that really doesn't help with any conservation efforts. Um, water costs are something that we see happening, uh, some increases across the state. Uh, right now, we have some of the lowest water rates in the nation. Um, but we've seen water rate increases by up to 4x in some areas. Um, the intent is to encourage water, but there's also costs associated with maintaining the water source. And as we see more and more of an understanding on how water is being used, I think that we're going to see some um, pretty unique ways that people are going to start setting up their water rate structures as cities work with that. Uh, secondary water is another thing that we see that's uh, being implemented more. Uh, ditch water, pond water, well water. It's lower cost for now. Um, a lot of the agencies are putting meters in and are charging for secondary water. Uh, there were days in the past where secondary water was considered free water uh, just because someone might pay $25 a year for all that they wanted to use. And I think that those days are behind us. I think that uh, water meters are being put in place so that we have visibility into what we're using. Uh, but with that comes some challenges with the, the need to uh, filter that water because it's not clean like the culinary water that goes into our homes. It can have particulates and, and other things depending on what the source is that need to be filtered out before we put it into our irrigation systems. And also potentially we're gonna to have to have a booster pump on our irrigation system to maintain the pressures that we need to operate efficiently. And political aspects. Uh, as you can see in the picture that I have there, we've got water, we got sprinklers on while uh, it's raining outside and, and that does not paint a pretty picture. I don't know how many times I've heard from people that they're driving by a park and the sprinklers are on, were on and it was raining and why is that? So we have to understand uh, what tools we have available to us and if we're using those correctly. If it's a storm that goes through real quick and it's only raining for five minutes, it's not likely it's gonna put down much usable water. But that perception behind that is that it, we're being wasteful because it's raining and we've got sprinklers on. So we need to understand what the expectations are from our organization, what the state and local laws are <clears throat> and Again, back to the training, we need to make sure that our personnel are trained sufficiently to be able to manage 
be irrigation systems to manage those expectations. Uh, just what we've covered real quick, uh, population growth, water scarcity, water restrictions, water cost, secondary water, political aspects are all things that have a direct impact on our water usage and how we manage our water or if we manage our water. And a statement that I read that's really interesting is that we are in a new era where it is no longer socially, economically, or environmentally sustainable to waste water. So what, what are our options? What can we do? And what I find and what I do on a daily basis is help people with smart controllers. Uh, with a smart controller, they pay for themselves very quickly. Uh, they're cloud-based, which means that you can access them from your phone, from the internet, um, significant amount of time rather than driving out to site and trying to manage a controller. You get a lot of data. And with data, you have that information to make decisions. Um, also, it helps protect your landscape. Your landscape's a large investment. It's also a potential risk for you if that water's not managed, uh, slip and fall or hardscape or landscape damage can take place if you don't manage it correctly. And then flow optimization. This was uh, spoken about earlier where flow is becoming more and more of a standard and people are using that to understand what the, where the water is going on their properties. Um, with the adoption of smart controllers, um, it's using measured ET and weather data. Um, very reliable, customizable automation, and it gives you control down to the station or program level, depending on the technology that you adopt. The uh, conservation districts are offering rebates to help offset the cost of controllers because they know the importance of having a smart controller on the wall to help with the management and the delivery of that water to the landscape so it's at the right time and the right amount. Um, customers are also choosing it because it's cloud-based. It's easy to learn. You can get it installed quickly and up and running, um, reliable, simple cellular communication, which is, which is the standard. There's other options, but the majority of people are using cellular, very easy to install and use. One of the biggest benefits though is remote access. You can use a mobile app to pull up your property, see what's going on and give you the tools that you need to manage what's happening with that irrigation site, or potentially even to manage and understand what assets you have on that site. And with those tools in hand, you're becoming much more effective because traditionally, a controller on the wall, once you leave that property, you have no visibility into what's happening. It's a set it and forget it, you know, the old wrong coke. It's, you, you hope that it's set correctly. And typically, and this is a kind of a cultural thing with the irrigation industry, is it would be set for the highest need. Um, even if it was watering in April, traditionally, um, you would have a controller set to water for July or August need. Uh, just because there's not the daily visits needed to adjust the schedule to maximize savings. I uh, talked about data, uh, right amount of the right data to the right person at the right time. Um, and what I like to say is not just data, but actionable data. It's great that I'm getting all this information, but what am I going to do with it? Uh, with smart controllers, you can know when a valve is, the solenoid isn't working, or if you have a flow condition. And when these alerts come through or this data comes through, you know what to do with it. There's an action associated with it. So it's not that, hey, cool, I can see all this information that's happened. I can see how much I've used, but when I have a break on a line or if I have a wire that's cut, I need to know that because that directly affects my ability to manage and to conserve on that property. Also, to protect that landscape, if you have a proven watering schedule that's utilizing ET and watering to the site needs, then you're going to put down the right amount of water at the right time. It also helps to minimize runoff so that you're not flooding out the neighbors or if you have hills and slopes, which a lot of the areas that we have here across the state, we deal with that. It's going to help make sure that that water that you put down stays on the landscape and just doesn't run down the hill. Um, the ability to respond to issues, again, with that data, uh, if you have a station that's not irrigating and your maintenance crew goes out and it looks at that and says, hey, our lawn's dead because uh, they only visit weekly, whatever it may be. Uh, you're going to be putting down more water to try and get it back and get it healthy again. So if you can respond to that before it becomes an issue, that just helps you with your management practices. And some agencies uh, require a, a reporting of, of your water used. And technology is going to allow you to do that. The last thing would be uh, flow optimization and, that, and leak detection. Uh, you can have a smart controller and it does a great job. And you've saved so much water over the summer and your landscape is looking great. And you could have one catastrophic break event 
that completely wipes that out. And so all that hard work you had over the summer, that one break just eliminated any savings that you realized. And so being able to have flow optimization to help you manage when there are issues like that, it's going to allow you to better respond and to better manage your properties so that you are being responsible with that water use. Uh, smart controllers are, have a high adoption rate across the state. Very excited with uh, the amount of people that are looking to smart controllers as a solution. Thank you, Joe. Um, Appreciate you sharing that. Kind of money, this, as mentioned, um, again, if you, if you have your, some questions for Joe, investment goals. be thinking of those, so type you them in the Q&A box. We're going to do a kind of panel and a and question and answer to as you use them. Uh, following Stuart. And again, so Stuart, if you um, want to go ahead and, do, and be support, sharing your screen uh, and pulling that up, I'll go ahead and introduce Stuart Irene at this point. We are concluding the presenter for this session. So, Stuart, that, Stuart I'll, Irene uh, is the CEO at Orbit Irrigation, irrigation president of Hydro Rain, uh, worldwide leaders in water watering innovation. Um, as CEO and president, he drives the growth of retail, professional, digital, and international channels, leads worldwide engineering, manufacturing, and quality systems, and pioneers water-related solutions for residential, commercial, and agricultural irrigation markets. And so uh, I'm going to turn the time over to Stuart. There's one little known Little known fact, I guess it's a little fun fact. Many of you are familiar with the Irrigation Association uh, that, that provides certifications and trainings. And just a little known fact, Stuart Irene happens to be the worldwide leader of certifications with the IA. He's the, he has the most certifications in the world and he's right here local with us. So appreciate having Stuart taking a little time to be with us today. So Stuart, go ahead and share your screen. If you wanna introduce yourself a little more, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you, David. I appreciate that introduction. And all those certifications and a dollar lets me shop on the dollar menu at McDonald's. Um, I appreciate uh, Stephanie and Joe, uh, and they really, I think, set up nicely for what will just be the, the third part of this. I'll get a little bit more into the, the details of the actual uh, equipment it, itself, both uh, in the irrigation equipment and the, and the controllers. It's very nice to be here with you. Um, all of those certifications really mean that I love water. I know how to apply it efficiently, efficiently in residential, commercial, and uh, golf and, and in ag applications. Um, just through this presentation, let's think of this as I'm targeting a 15% reduction in irrigation water usage across all usages of irrigation. And I'll show you how, how fast and easily um, I, I can get there. I was in a lounge chair recently on spring break at a pool in uh, St. George and the sprinklers came on and they started spraying me in that uh, chair. So I investigated, I found a misaligned spray head, a bad wiper seal, it was damaging the wrought iron fence and spraying onto the pool deck and wasting water. With pressure regulated spray, spray bodies, which Stephanie mentioned, and correct nozzles properly adjusted, water use in that zone can be reduced 15%. All right, so I walked out of the clubhouse and there was a rotor, worn gears, it wasn't rotating and it was spraying right into that tree. And so you're getting a ton of runoff off of that tree. You can see the dry spots off to the right where it's not rotating. And again, with a few simple adjustments, this 3G GPM ro rotor, um, the, the efficiency could have been improved uh, 15%. Um, and then again, you know, in that area with that many trees that actually should be converted to uh, to spray is not an ideal area for, for a rotor. Okay, and then on the way from the condo, here's a spray zone. It's been converted to bubblers. Okay, you can see it's been converted because you can see the spray over against that palm tree, right? And in this case, these bubblers should really be called puddlers. Uh, with better placement of the bubblers, uh, savings would be 15%. If the area were con converted to drip line, the savings could be as high as 35%. And then here's an interesting area. First, it's a really tight space. I'm sure when these Mondell pines were put in, um, there was, it looked like there was plenty of space for them. Obviously they're pretty, they're in there pretty tight. Um, they don't need a ton of water, but you can see they're being watered with sprays. That's super inefficient. You can see the, 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 the light layer, the thin layer of clay down that soil. So you've got a ton of runoff. It's unlikely that that water's even getting two inches deep in there. This is a very easy conversion to point source drip. And if you combine that with a smart controller with cycle and soaking, 
that cut the water use for that in half. And those Mondel pines would be much happier. This is an example of a middle school um, up in kind of the Park City area. It has a very expensive controller on it. I was the irrigation audit supervisor here. Uh, the problem is the contractor left it set to the default precipitation rate of 1.7 inches. Uh, a catch cup test showed that the actual precipitation rate was 2.3 inches. And so that represents a 25% water reduction on a zone that was using 9,000 gallons every 10 minutes. It's a 90 GPM zone. And this is my alma mater, and I feel bad for showing it, but my, my, my kids are as good as I am at, at noticing problems. So they happen to take, they take this picture, they go to school there. And on this cold day in April, where the high was 46 degrees, the controller was set, and Joe mentioned this, like it was July. Scaling the watering to the actual plant requirements for each season reduces the, the, the uh, watering from the 41.5 inches of that July set to a 33 inches uh, across, across the season. And then this is a, a, a church where, forget the fact that it's a combination of sprays and, and rotors, which makes for really bad efficiency, but worse, it's watering in, in the rain. We average in our May to September precipitation, six inches. As I mentioned, the plants, um, you know, ET, ET is 33 inches. If you figure, you know, 80% effective rainfall from that, that's another 15% uh, op opportunity in terms of, of savings. We often talk about the significant percentage of um, with irrigation withdrawal or of water withdrawals that irrigation accounts for. But what's really important is the consumption part of it. Uh, it's really relevant because that's the that reflects the water that's no longer available in the drainage basin. On a global basis, irrigation water is over ninety percent of consumption. And so let's let's then talk about how that irrigation can be addressed on really a faucet to farm approach. And as you look here, this is the, the beehive lineup. It covers from faucet to farm. Um, I'll apologize for, this, I guess, maybe some of the commercial nature of kind of showing this, this to you, but I think it gives you good perspective. And so it's just helpful to see that on the left are the ho host faucet controllers, Stephanie mentioned them, uh, residential landscape controllers, commercial landscape controllers, and then uh, center pivot uh, con controllers. Um, that's the beehive lineup. The radios across them, there are short range radios included in them. And then the ones on the right, so commercial and ag, have long range radios. So the real point of what these smart controllers do, as has been mentioned, is they improve on mother nature to provide the precise amount of supplemental water based on the uh, plant water use. And so there's a prediction, the evapotranspiration, uh, Joe, Joe talked about that. You take into account rainfall um, and then really just supplement it with the irrigation and do that in a way that you prevent runoff and deep percolation. Uh, you can then see what that calculation looks like. And so that's just a screen from the Beehive app that shows you your beginning moisture, moisture level, your irrigation, your rainfall, um, net of your plant water use then gives you your ending water balance. This is in contrast, and I just saw this in the, in the paper again the other day, the guideline of, of water between 10 and 20 minutes to apply a half, half an inch. In the case of Utah bench soils, you really need to apply about 0.33 inches and 12 inch minutes would really be the max or you'll create runoff and deep, deep percolation. And so if you're running that for that full 20 minutes and providing the, applying that full half inch, there's a 34% savings opportunity just on not following the half inch uh, rule. So smart, smart controllers are a lot smarter than a very general rule. The second key feature of smart irrigation controllers, and this is the entire the beehive lineup, um, is compatible and universal with all makes of, of equipment. And that's across, it's everything from a traveling sprinkler on a, on a hose faucet to a spray head, to drip, to center pivot. Next slide. Then as was mentioned, it's really key that 
it, the controllers not only apply water precisely, but also there's the ability with the app to measure flow, detect leaks, and to shut off the main line in the event of anomalies. Um, that's really key cap capability. Um, our capability works on culinary systems. We're a little bit unique here in Utah, where on our secondary systems, we're using the uh, iPearl meters. They're ultrasonic, and they just happen to not work with this technology. So sorry, a little bit of disappointment for our local folks in terms of capability uh, there. But uh, Dave and I have talked about working with census to try to uh, overcome that obstacle. In terms of uh, how effective smart controllers are from a precipitation standpoint, April 26, we had 0.8 inches of precipitation. We, on that day, had 55 1,151 clocks in their controllers in Utah. 19,500 of them were in off mode, including mine. Uh, 34,500 of them were in rain delay mode. And then there were 1,000 people out there who uh, were going rogue, but 97% of active controllers were in rain delay at 1,200 gallons per uh, system that saves the, really the target amount of Salt Lake County of saving 43 million gallons of water this year is achieved with rain delays in, in Utah overall in a single day of rain delays just on those 34,000 or 35,000 active controllers. And then in terms of globally, um, what this means is it beehives in 153 uh, countries, but we've saved over 144,000 uh, acre feet of water. Um, these save savings are calculated on actual amount of rainfall de uh, deducted from irrigation schedules. Uh, we have over uh, a million uh, beehives uh, wor worldwide. So it just gives you a sense of kind of what the magnitude is of savings opportunities. From a farm standpoint in uh, enter enterprise, uh, we had a unique um, project together with the, the, the state, county, and, and district, uh, which allowed for an expansion of the ir irrigated land with a reduction in water. Uh, irrigated uh, land went from 9,000 to 11,000 acres. Water usage went from 36,000 to the agreed upon 31,500, so that's a 4,500 acre foot or 1.5 billion gallon reduction of water. That water then is left in the Burl Enterprise Aquifer, and there was a 20% operating profit increase to the business. This is just a great example of when the stakeholder interests are aligned the right way and technology can make a difference across sectors. It doesn't have to be limited to just M&I. The key end markets where the technology can address range all the way from faucet to, to farm. The key capabilities are creating a smart schedule, being able to deliver it to any system, being able to detect leaks where there are anomalies to be able to shut it off. And then the key companion actions, choosing water wise plants, selecting the right equipment, maintaining the equipment. And then I'll importantly just plug for hiring IA certified and water sense certi certified. So there's just some concrete examples um, and thank you very much. And, and I really appreciate the districts, county, state, and the EPA uh, for, for their support. There's a lot of really good work going on, especially to, to the uh, Water Conservation Forum. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart and Joe and Stephanie. We really appreciate all of you taking some time to review this. So there, there are some questions. Uh, I've got just a few questions here that have kind of come through the, the chat as well as the Q&A box. So I think let's start with, the, I'll just start with the Q&A box. And some of these aren't specific to any one of you. So all of you may be able to address a couple of these questions that have come up. One was, um, how are we going to convert or convince the general public to get on board with water conservation, both with culinary and secondary water users alike? And so you know, with the broad spectrum of things you've talked about, Stephanie with the EPA and Joe and, and Stuart with products and so forth, feel free, any one of you, all of you can unmute your microphones and, and see if you can address that question a bit in your perspective. Uh, well, I guess I'll start. Um, I think with, you know, with, from our perspective, I mean, that's sort of water senses, you know, one of our goals is to help people sort of understand the benefits of water efficiency. 
Um, I think it's just, you know, like just driving home the message that there are simple ways to save water, that you can save water without, you know, making a huge sacrifice in your style of living. Uh, you can save a lot of money. Um, you can save, uh, like for businesses in particular, you can save money on terms of like labor and uh, costs of like for putting in these newer technologies. And I think there's just lots of benefits to it besides just the fact that you'll save water. And so I think, you know, just really sort of getting out those benefits to people and making them sure they understand that, um, I think that will help. And then, you know, I think there's also a lot of, uh, you know, poor perception about the performance of these products over time. And I think that's starting to change. People are starting to put them in. They're starting to really see how they work well. And I think that's sort of, I think that'll help them um, be more confident about installing these products in the future. Yeah, I, yeah. yeah I agree with Stephanie. I think a lot of it is just, um, just helping the end user understand uh, the tools that are available to them. So a lot of the homeowners and I wouldn't just limit it to homeowners, but you also have a lot of the commercial users that there's really, there's not a lot of motivation to, to conserve. They're just doing things the way they have for a long time. Um, a lot of the new technologies and then with the conservation districts offering rebates are helping to overcome some of those challenges as far as costs are associated with adopting technologies, whether at a residential level or at a commercial level. And then I think helping them understand why that's a good thing helping them understand that they can have a healthier landscape, that these technologies aren't, technologies aren't something to be afraid of, but are, should be embraced, and then offering the training or the tools necessary to help them do so. Um, I, I think, in general, I think most people are going to want to try and conserve water. I, I don't think that everyone's just a water waster. I think they do so unintentionally um, because they don't understand the technology or don't understand how much they're using. But as we have more insight into how much water we're actually using and what role we play in the overall water use, and then what can we do to do a better job? I think that education and you know just understanding that there are tools, there is technology out there to accomplish that. Stuart, do you have anything to add on that? One thing I would add is I think that EPA does a really good job. Um, in the US though, I think we have a bigger task and, and it, it's that we manage water very, very regionally. So I would just highlight the Bureau of Meteorology in Australia um, as an example of what can happen with water conservation when there's a concerted uh, national approach, approach to it. It's probably beyond the scope of, of this forum, but as, as Stephanie, I'm sure from an EPA standpoint, you recognize the need to address this on a more um, national le level with, with greater uh, concert uh, among the different the different entities, I think, will produce an even an, an amplified result. Great, I've got another question, and this one may be more aligned for Joe and Stuart. It's what do you see as the single biggest challenge for implementing and applying the technology into Utah landscapes? You want to take Go that ahead. one first, Stuart. Go, go, Joe. I, I'm, I'll riff off of you. All right. Um, I think, uh, I think education. I really think that is, David. I think that if people don't know that there is a better way of doing it, they're not going to make any changes. Um, you know, working with a lot of customers, uh, we see a lot of new generation, younger people coming in that are embracing technology. Um, but we have some of the people that have been doing it for a long time, and that's worked for them and their businesses. And what's the incentive to change? Uh, you know, like I said, rebates have made a big difference in people overcoming the price hurdle, but we have to help them understand that it's going to save them time. Their landscapes are going to be healthier. They need to understand what the benefits are, but they aren't even going to start looking if they don't know that they are using too much. And I think the conservation districts and some of the water agencies are sending out more informed billing that help them understand how much water they're using. I think this is a great first step. So, but I feel that if someone doesn't understand the role that they're playing and that they may be a water waster, they may be using more than they need until we hit that point, they're really not gonna start looking for solutions. So I think education and information is, is one of the biggest hurdles. Yep, and I'm a big believer in, in, in metering. I think especially in, in Utah, and, and if you look at a district like, you know, the, the Weber Basin where you have high percentage of secondary users, I, I think the metering is a key part of, of Joe that awareness. 
Stephanie, do you, would you have anything to add to that question either? No, I think they, they covered it. Really. Okay. I, I would agree, like knowledge about how much you're using and then just what to do about that. Great. There's another question in this, again, this could maybe be for any of you um, to, to address this. You don't all have to, but if you'd like to comment on this, why should uh, potable water users be concerned about saving water when 85% of the water in Utah is used in agriculture? And a potable may be used, meaning residential. Um, so why should residents be concerned about this when, when there's a, such a high use in ag? Any comments from any of you on that one? I would, I would make a quick comment on that. I would, I would like to see how much ag, agricultural land is being converted to residential or commercial. And I think if we can get ahead of that curve on adoption and conservation now, um, there's, there's less ag every single day as we have more developments going in. And yes, there is a high use. Ag has actually been faster to adopt technology than commercial has. It's pretty amazing as you go to some of the shows, seeing the technology that these manufacturers are developing and then in turn, how quick the farmers are, are adopting that. And I think a lot of it comes down to what Stuart identified as a potential increase in profits for that individual, because for them, it's a business. And so the more effective they can be and the more cost they can reduce, the more effective they will be in putting money in their pocket and being sustainable as a business. With residents, there's, you know, what is the motivation for them to adopt? It might only represent 15% of the usage in Utah or, you know, wherever that metric is coming from but it's still a large number and that is i see that starting to flip here in the state as we have more and more uh, ag being converted so they i think it's a business looking at saving for a reason and what is that reason for the the homeowner any any additional thoughts there if not we'll go to the next question um I, maybe maybe i will add just one thing on that is uh, this doesn't necessarily answer the question but Agriculture water is producing a crop and it's a product and it, and it plays into the economy differently. This you know, doesn't necessarily justify residents versus agriculture not using or not participating in conservation and doing their part. But uh, you, if you think about a cash crop, nobody's selling their grass clippings on the market. And maybe I'll just leave it at that. It's residents, the, the amount of water put on residential, municipal, I guess, municipal outdoor water we all need to take part of that. Agriculture, sure, there, there's room to be efficient there. And like Joe said, there's things are moving that direction. That is a, it's feeding people, it's feeding animals. It, it plays into our, you know, our existence a little differently, but I'll leave it at that. David, so next David, question is uh, David, what percentage? David, oh yes, go I, ahead, Stuart. I will just, because you and I talk about this a lot. I, I think we do have to say is that if you look at the Great Basin side, you know, drainage side of, of, of Utah, the reality is that with these technologies across, you know, from, from residential to, to farm, there's plenty of water. Um, and, and we talk about this, this, this a lot. Um, there's, there's so much opportunity to, to, to save that, um, you know, it's just, it's just a matter of, of getting the awareness there and, and getting the adoption to happen. I'm confident it will, and, and I'm confident we'll achieve the 25% the reduction goals. Great, there's a couple more questions. There's a few specific ones. We're, we're getting a little short in time. We'll try to get through these quickly. Again, any of you can answer these questions. What percentage of household water use is in the landscape and how much is used for agriculture crops versus household use? Kind of along the same lines as maybe that question before, if, if any of you wanna address that, or, or I can throw out a number there as well. You, you know, David, that we say 70%, but the reality is that it's 80 to 90% in secondary usage households. Yeah, so kind of just statewide averages, we're looking at 65 to 70% of municipal use. So this is, this is water that's delivered to cities goes outdoors. So this is you, you as a household user, you know, the small businesses, the things in your community. 65 to 70 percent of that goes outdoors but as Stuart mentioned in, in certain secondary areas that percentage goes up because people tend especially if it's unmetered they tend not to know what they're using therefore they're using more uh, but when you compare that to agricultural crops and putting values to those you know gallons per acre feet and stuff it's a whole different thing I don't know that we have time to dive into that uh, but Dan if you want to follow up with any of us on on that we could go into that a little more later on so 
one other question here. Do we have the right personnel in place for managing commercial systems in Utah? Well, that, that is a, a question that I always quite, I ask myself as well. One of the biggest challenges we have is uh, I don't really care what the technology is that you're utilizing. If you're not trained on it or if you're not someone that cares about using that technology, it's, it's, it might as well be a brick. Um, you need to have someone that is cares about what they do. They need to be willing to learn the technology. They need to be able to understand the tools that are available to them. And we do have a problem in Utah where the people that are touching those controllers, as far as in the commercial world, um, they're not going to be the ones that are incentivized through pay or other means to stay in that position. Um, I would love to see more attention paid to those that are true water managers. Those are, that are in control of the programming or monitoring or managing an irrigation system because that one person can directly affect saving millions and millions of gallons. And then you add that across the different portfolios, portfolios of different cities, school, school districts. It, that number gets pretty scary if it's, uh, you realize that I'm just putting water in the landscape unmanaged. So I would say we could do a better job of having the right people in place or at least providing them tools to have better education and to really care about what they do. Not saying that they don't, but uh, you know, having those right people is very, very important. Any other comments from either of the other two? I, I would just say, say on that, and, and, and that is using as an example, Stephanie mentioned um, rotators as efficient nozzles, but if you actually go out and do audits on the way that they're installed, they, typical nozzles come in eight, 10, 12, 15, those are commonly installed. The rotators tend to come in a single, uh, throw distance radius and, and then that needs to be adjusted. Um, very few contractors in my experience actually go into middle so what would be full pattern rotators and actually adjust those to be head to head so I see very high precipitation rates there. It's just a big argument for doing more uh, catch cup testing. I don't see it happening um, that gives me concern that it's not a question of do we have the right people, is that are people really taking the steps they need to, especially on those big high water user sites, to assess the PR. You, you can be, I've seen cases where they're rotator nozzles and they're running 20% uh, above the rated um, precipitation rate. That absolutely, if that's not figured out, it doesn't matter how smart the clock is, it will not time, time correctly. So, so I think the people can do it. They just need to do it. We can save, we can save water if we take a, take a diligent approach. Okay, I appreciate that. We're, we're right at time, but I wanted each of you to give one, one last statement maybe about where you see the vision of technology going, you know, as we kind of go into the future, technology is always improving. From your individual perspectives, if you could just give us a brief, where do you see this heading you know, over the next few years as far as technology goes? Um, well, I think we're just going to see more uh, tech companies coming into the market. I think um, when you have sort of criteria, which is what WaterSense tries to do, developed, then they can come in and say like, oh, we can figure out a solution for how to provide that. And I think you're gonna see more user-friendly technology. You're gonna see more sophisticated technology. And I think the prices are gonna come down for individual users as well. And I would say, I think we're gonna have more of that technology come into our smart devices, our, our cell phones, and being able to use that and be more effective. Um, either more functionality or enhanced functionality so that you're not spending time in front of the controller or having to go back to an office to get on the computer if you are using smart controllers, that that technology is just going to see further improvement at your in your hand. And I think that that's where we'll see things go. Stuart? Yeah, and I just say I, I appreciated um, the, the perspectives and appreciate everything the forum is uh, stri striving to do. And my opinion is, is shared in the sense that there's a lot of opportunity here. Technology can um, help, help things along, um, but this is, a, this is an opportunity area and uh, there's, there's a lot we can do. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you all, Stephanie, Joe, and Stuart, taking your time to be with us today. 
I, I think there were a few questions through the chat that I never got to that were a little bit specific. So if you posted a question to any of these panelists, um, you can go back and reference the slides or you can you can send us an email or something. We'll, we'll try to address those concerns. They were a little bit pointed, a little direct, not, not, not completely connected to technology, but again, thank you very much. And I'm gonna turn it over to Rick to kind of wrap it up for us. Yes, thank you everybody for joining today. I uh, just wanna really quickly remind everybody that uh, the second part of this series will be next Thursday on the 13th. Uh, feel free to join us. We'll have uh, a panel discussing some new research that's emerging from Utah State University uh, that'll be very interesting. And we're also gonna be talking about gray water, uh, which is a growing topic in the West and there's a lot of concerns about how we may manage that in the future and we'll, we'll cover that. And so we're excited to have you and, and hopefully we'll see you uh, back next week. And thanks for joining.